If we were to put a time limit on it, how fast could you recognize that tune? Well, it's just you and I. Stan's not here right now, but he'll be back soon. He had to pee. It's the Dressman Show. Yeah. Where do we go today? What are we doing today? What are we doing next? Uh, wait, why? Set the tone, Stan. Set the tone. Set the tone in life and the microphone. Set the tone, Stan. Set the tone. Where are we going today? We're going to voicemails again, Marshall. Okay, let's do voicemails because people have questions and we want to honor those questions. So let's do that. Let's do it. But first, what's going on with you? I missed you. You were gone for 30 minutes? That's right. It was like a 20 some minute separation. <laughs> yeah. And you, you've come back and you seem like you're in good health and good spirits. So I'm still here. You survived this. An absence of Marshall was not that big a deal. Well, let's see. Uh, I have been spending a good deal of time in anatomy books. I gave away lots of anatomy books. You gave me a bunch. I gave you a bunch and yeah. I gave other art instructors, I gave one art instructor a big stack of all of the major anatomy books because I figured I was done with them and now... I'm borrowing them back, and I'm even buying some extra ones. Do you know who William Rimmer was? No. William Rimmer is like mid-19th century, 1860, somewhere around there, and he did an anatomy book of the, some of the most bizarre characters. I I think it's fascinating, uh, and there's, there's stories behind it, but that's one that has been out of print for a long time, and I've been pouring into Bridgman, looking at Richet, huh. Richet's subdued style, uh, just really enjoying it. Yeah. It's just, you know, there's a wonderful quote from, oh, I was going to give you a wonderful quote from Robert Beverly Hale. Okay. But I can't give it to you. You know why? Oh, I, I think I heard a truck in the back, but you know what? It's... There is a garbage truck. Yeah. Now, this garbage truck only comes around once a week, and I don't know whether we want to waste this. I, I, I think maybe we should just keep going. This is a stay-at-home episode. Yeah, I wish I would have had my phone ready and I could have shown you the garbage truck. You know, a lot of grown-ups don't acknowledge how awesome those things are. They are. Cooper is actually obsessed with garbage trucks. Yeah, yeah. He loves garbage trucks. He, like, yeah. he, anytime he hears the garbage truck, it comes around once a week. He wants to go out there and watch it. Um, and then yes. at night, before going to bed, he's always like, I want to see garbage truck. And he, he's like, I just see garbage trucks, see garbage trucks, because he wants me to play videos of garbage trucks. He could sit there for an hour just watching garbage truck videos. I, it, it's the big <laughs> physical strength, isn't it? I don't know. It's it, Yeah, it is. It's an interesting machine, though. It, it lifts things up. It dumps things into itself and puts it back down. It's got wheels. <laughs> Yeah, they are a trip. I remember getting my dose of garbage trucks when my son was your age. We went out to see it every time. Yeah. And you know, when you think of driving a garbage truck for a living, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think of a prestigious job. And yet, garbage truck drivers are total celebrities when it comes to almost every two to three-year-old kid. That that is the the visitation of the great strong angel who comes to our environment and who waves at me <laughs> and acknowledges my existence. Yeah. Yep. Garbage trucks are great. Hey, Stan, what have you been up to? Oh, uh, nothing much. I just found out that Lightbox this year is canceled. For those of you who don't know, Lightbox is a big deal, and Lightbox has just been canceled as a live event in person in Pasadena in September. And Stan and I just got our emails from Bobby Chu himself. 
letting us know the situation. But if you know Bobby Chu, this does not stop him from what he's going to do. I guess he hasn't planned it out yet, but he says that he's giving presenters or people that purchased a booth options of either moving it to 2021 or I guess getting a refund. Um, but he's yeah. also saying that uh, for guests, they're doing something online this year, okay. even though the actual convention's closed. So they're probably just going to do like live streams with the artists that were supposed to present. I wonder how they're going to do it. Hey guys, Future Stan here. It's funny, I'm editing this video right now, and just an hour ago, I actually talked to Bobby Chu about Lightbox Expo this year, and it's actually going to be pretty good, I think. Um, he's doing it a little bit differently from what I've seen other conventions doing during this COVID thing. So even though the in-person convention is canceled, the online one might be pretty cool. They're being pretty creative with the way they're planning it out. So, yeah. Okay, well, yeah, that's news. So what have you? What else have you been up to? Man, it's mostly Proco 2.0 trying to launch it. There's always issues, you know, with technology that pushes things back. The people who are coming to your site and working with it, they never think about all that goes on behind the scenes. But anyone who manages their own website and has to design their own website gets a little inkling. Just a little tiny piece of it, yeah. A little sliver of a percentage of what you're going through because you're doing a whole platform. Yeah. But yeah, I, I just redoing our website uh, in the last couple months and then mentioning to other people and they've talked, I mentioned it to Sean and he said that when he did his website and redesigned how much he was pulling his hair out and it's like, Sean is the guy that I go to for comfort on <laughs> technical issues and if it made him miserable, yeah. Yeah. So I, I have some empathy with what you're going through, but only a tiny bit. You suffer <laughs> for the convenience of others. I'm doing it for you. Thank you. Nobody else, just you, Marshall. I don't know whether I should feel flattered or whether there's a tinge of sarcasm in there. It is 100% sarcasm. I kind of figured. <laughs> You've accused me of sarcasm when I wasn't being sarcastic. Well, maybe it's your fault somehow. <laughs> might have been. It might be that I just overdo the uh, overdo something. Well, okay. I'm just so glad we're here, Stan. Yeah. Are you Are you excited to hear some more questions that you have to answer? I am. Let's go right to the voicemails. What do you guys think of David Ross's book on figure drawing? What do we think of David Ross's course on figure drawing? Book on figure drawing. I don't know it. Yeah, I don't know it either. Oh, that was an that easy was question. Easy. Okay, next. Boy, you got us off the hook. Thank you. Ah, oh, crap, Marshall. We might not have enough questions. Yeah, well. Hi, my name is Stella. Um, I just had a question about the podcast that came out yesterday uh, where I guess Dan said to you know, begin networking while you're still in university. Um, I guess it's like, what does that really mean? Because like right now I'm an online student and I'm trying to like keep in contact with my classmates but does he mean networking is more like doing like collaborations with them or like trying to work on separate projects or just things outside of the class? So I guess just a little more detail on that. Thank you. Bye. Well, I guess she's just looking for examples, huh? How do you network while you're in school? And she's looking for examples specifically in online training? Well, she said she's an online student. Um, okay. So it kind of, it doesn't apply to what we were specifically talking about there which was, you know, you're networking. We said your networking begins when you're in school because all of your fellow classmates become part of your network. Your teachers become part of your network. Yes. Online, it doesn't apply nearly as much because first of all, your teachers, you're not going to be able to get a very good relationship with them because they have thousands of students now instead of dozens, right? If it's that kind of thing, but if it's like it was when we had 15 to 25 people in an online class, I have never met Cody Shank in person. Yeah, but that's rare, Marshall. Like online, when someone says I'm studying online, they don't mean they're doing what you just said. They mean they're probably watching videos. They're they're buying courses from us or New Masters Academy. Oh, or okay. They're watching recorded stuff. Yeah. Probably. Or taking workshops like 
you know, or doing some school or something. Yeah. Okay. I got you. Right. And so, you don't have a year or two or three to develop a relationship with the person online unless you're taking the same workshops with the same people, then they'll start noticing you. It's just, it, it's, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's just, it's much harder to develop a relationship with a teacher online than if you're actually in school, right? Um, and s- same thing with your fellow classmates. You know, you, you don't go out after class and sketch somewhere. So, what bright and useful information can we give? Go to events. Even if you're still in school and your priority is to learn, you should still try to get some experience, go out there and go to conventions, go to sketch groups and 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 get some fellow students that are, are near you also learning to draw, even if they're not taking the same class as you. And start networking really all it means is building relationships. Yeah. You don't know which... Which of your friends eventually becomes, uh, you know, creative director of something and gives you a job. And so, just be nice to everybody. Be genuinely interested in other people and and that's networking. But <laughs> be social. Make note of people's strengths too. When you are aware that somebody is good at something, even if they aren't good at the things that everybody else is looking for, they may be the least good drawer or painter in the group, and they may be the best salesperson or manager or public relations or whatever else. And to keep an eye out for who has skills that you can use. (laughs) Or just be genuinely interested in the person just because they're a person. And who knows what they're going to end up being really good at. Um, or yeah. maybe it's not them that helps you. It's you You are going to end up helping them. Yeah. I mean, Marshall, I think you help more people than people help you. You know, you you, hmm. recomm- you constantly connect other people and you, you're constantly uh, getting other people jobs. But I think, you know, when you need it, it comes back to you. you. You can ask a lot of people for help and everyone will help you. Networking is is making friends. Yeah. It's just ma- it's making friends with people that are in the same arena. Maybe profession, maybe preparation for the profession. And making them they they can be short term or long term, but you're hoping they're you're making them positive. Okay. Here comes the next one. Hello Stan, hello Marshall. Uh, my name is Alfredo, but um I actually have two questions. Uh, my first question is about book covers. Do you guys, as a reference, uh, do you guys charge uh, for the cover and spine and the backing as one price or do you separate the three into three different uh, pricing? And also, uh, do you receive royalties uh, when you're communicating with the client? Do you uh, ask them to receive royalties for the sales of the uh, of the book? And um, my second question is, is um, I recently purchased an iPad Pro, and and now I'll be doing more more digital art, and um, I wanted to know like what as a reference what you guys idea of uh, for pricing digital artwork is. Um, do you price it as original work or does it do you price it as as prints or does it have its own uh, separate category? Um, and that's it. Thank you. Have a good one. Um, okay, three questions. Do, do, do you was remember? Was the first one about charging for book covers? Yeah, there was, do, do you charge this different, something different for the spine and the back and the front? Irene Gallo would be the one to answer that because she knows everything about it. And she hires people to do book covers and everything else. And people who who do book covers, I can't, I can't answer it. I, I negotiated all my own uh, commissions for illustration at first and learned as I went and found out that the answer was it just depends on the client, depends on the job. And when you have an agent to do that or a rep to do that, that's great. That means you don't have to worry about it. And I, that happened with me a few times too, but I cannot answer that question. I don't know how usage rights and, and reuse rights and all those other things are working these days. Yeah. It, it, there's probably industry standards and the company you work with is either going to already be following them or be open to what whatever you're doing whatever your structure is right 
you might not even have a choice. You know, if you're doing a comic f- or a, co- a cover for Marvel or something, they're, they're going to give you your <laughs> the deal. Alfredo, sorry not to be able to help you, but Stan, do you know of or does anyone know of? And they can put in the comments seminars or workshops or experts who teach on pricing. Maria Piscopo used to be the one that everybody went to when I was an illustrator. She did seminars on how to market yourself and how to price and all sorts of things. She was great, too. She was right in the mix of it. Uh, So we learned a lot from her, but I don't know that she's still teaching, and I don't know who's doing this now. So if you know of anyone who is a go-to person on how to do that stuff, help out the community here. This is your opportunity to network. The other question was, um, if you try to negotiate royalties, um, my advice on that is, if you believe in the book, if you think that there will actually be a lot of sales of this book, then yeah, try to negotiate royalties. If you think that this is, um, it's better to just get paid a large, you know, a, a, a one sum of money for it, and you're going to make more off of that than the sale of the book, do that. You know, if you think it's it's a book being done by someone who maybe it's their first book and they, they're hiring you to, to do it and you're not sure if it's going to do well, <laughs> then just get paid for the job. Use your best judgment here. Sometimes you don't, again, you don't have a choice. There's always a Punnett square of options too, is that you could say, I want the t- I want to take the cash right up front rather than have a royalty. Yeah. Watch the watch the movie Inside Lewin Davis. It was a Coen Brothers film. I, Oscar Isaacs played uh, the character to see an example of what can happen with that. Uh, you took the money and didn't take the royals. The other is you take the royalties and you don't take the cash up front because the client doesn't have the, the cash. And we know of stories about that. In fact, I heard one even in the last couple of weeks of a mutual friend who is now really wealthy because the client didn't have much money and gave him a small percentage of this company that ended up making him rich because the the guy went for the royalties instead. But you can also go for the royalties and end up having donated the work and nothing comes of it. Yeah, the whole project just doesn't, it's a big flop and then they cancel it and nothing happens. Yeah. Or you can just say, no, I need the cash up front and it needs to be more than that because I need it right now. And they can say yes or no. And you've got all options. But again, how could anybody advise you on that? All I'm trying to do is give you some kind of a matrix so you can see here are my options. And working for a lack of money and royalties is something you do when you believe in the project that you say, I want to be part of this and I think it could go and you bring energy to it that might that might likely give you mm-hmm. income later. Your third question about pricing digital artwork. I think the way I've seen digital artists do this is they do limited runs of a pr- of the print. So they'll they'll say I-, I will only print 10 of these or I'll only print 100 of these or whatever they choose. And then they never print it again. And so it because it's a limited run, it ha- it has more value. And so, yeah. it's not an original. I don't think you can ever really call it an original, right? Because the original yeah. is a digital file. Um, but you could do a limited run of the prints and they're all signed. Yeah. And you could even do like official certificates and stuff like that. And that yeah. makes them a little more valuable. And that's a legal contract too. When you tell everybody, I'm going to only print a limited number of these, yeah. you are bound to do that because that's what they paid for us, hoping the value will go up. And this is not new. This has been going on ever since prints were made, limited edition prints, where a person would do a lithograph, they'd print 250 things, and then they would strike through and, and destroy the original stone plate that it came from so that there's only going to be those many prints. That's crazy. I mean, that was going all the way up until uh, the dawn of digital. And there it, still, it still is going on, I'm sure. Yeah. But now it's just a digital version. You can always cheat, but it's not honoring the contract. If you say, I'm going to print only this many. And sometimes in those contracts, you can make a stipulation that I'm going to only print so many at this size, right. and then I'm going to make it available as a playing card or something else. Again, those are questions for an agent. Those are questions for a business manager, for someone who knows all that stuff. I don't know that we have enough 
to really speak to this with any authority. Yeah, I think um, if you ever go to a convention, just go to a booth of somebody that's selling limited edition prints. And the way you could see is they'll they'll put like in the bottom left corner or something like two out of 100. And then you just talk to them. Like, how do you do this? Hey, there was an artist that I saw at Designer Con named Brian Reedy, R-E-E-D-Y, who does these amazing... Uh, uh, I don't know whether they're wood cuts or, or, or linoleum cuts or, or maybe both, mm-hmm. where he does them in an old Albrecht Durer style, but he does them with anachronisms in there. They're modern stuff like Superman or, or 20th century comic book figures, but I thought they were marvelous. And he seems to have been really making a business out of this. I don't want to tell you to bother him with emails about how he does it, but you might start by knowing about his artwork seeing if he ever does any teaching or sharing stuff about how that works. Yeah. Uh, but even if just to know that he's doing it, here's someone who's doing uh, an unusual thing that I was very impressed with. And those are where every one of them is a print from a source that I don't know whether they're limit, limited editions or not, but even if they aren't, they're worth seeing. Yeah. Cool. Hello there. Uh, my name is Diego Pons. I'm on my first year of college, um, wanted to uh, start a career in art, Um, but uh, I've talked with different professors and they told me two different things. One of them told me to become specialized in uh, in my craft, like if I want to be an illustrator, become an illustrator, nothing else, nothing more, just boom, be good illustration. But my other teacher that told me that it's better to have a wider or a lot of arrangement of skills. Like, I can be an illustrator, I can be a graphic designer, I can have some knowledge of this, some knowledge of that. Like, be basically an art journalist with some specialization in illustration. Do you believe that it's better to become specialized in a specific thing and that's it? Or do you think it's better to have a general knowledge of all art practices and focus more on one thing? Well, thank you so much. Also, on my team. <laughs> Take care. Well, I, I do have a strong opinion on this one. Let's hear yours because I could take either side of it and defend it. But yeah, I, I think I know. But <laughs> Your go ahead. answer is hear. it depends. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it yeah. depends. Yeah, okay. Well, my answer is I, I strongly believe in uh, cross-training and being good at a lot of things. Because, for example, if you want to be good at illustration, um, and but you study a few other things... Those few other things will make you a stronger illustrator as well. The way you combine things into your own thing is really what creativity is all about. And so, just focusing on one thing makes you very limited in your creativity. So, yeah, I've talked about it before. I believe that too. Even even referring back to Brian Reedy, he is making a combination of something that I've never seen anybody else do it before. He's interested in something old, and he's interested in these things that are new, and he put them together. Yeah, that's combining styles yeah, that's, that's, together, but you could also com- combine disciplines together in new right. ways as well. Yeah, but you you said you could take either side. Let's let's do the the other side of it. Well, the other side of it is more limited, and it might seem more boring. But let me give you an example from my experience. I got an opportunity when I was in my late 20s to airbrush shadows underneath products that were photographed under circumstances where the shadows were all over the place. So I had to airbrush out the background in white and airbrush in a shadow. And it was a near impossible thing to do because when you'd airbrush the shadow, all of the little flecks of paint would get into the white. And then when you'd airbrush the white, all the little flecks of paint (laughs) would get into the shadow and it had to be perfectly smooth. And the first few that I did were so impossible. I said, I'm going to get this thing done and I never want to do these again. And I worked for countless hours trying to get them done, but I got a few of them done and they paid okay. They paid pretty well, but then the client had some more and I needed money, and I came to the point where I made, all collectively, I made a small fortune of just airbrushing shadows before Photoshop came in, and it was grunt work. They would have a courier bring this to my door, I'd learned how to do it efficiently, I was a pro at it, and if I had done nothing else, 
up until Photoshop, I would have had a good living just with that. And it didn't really take cross-discipline and it wasn't creative. It was just that you need money, you got this money tree. Boom, do these things and they will pay you. And they were paying me $150 a shadow and I was getting to where I could do them in less than an hour a piece and I could do several of them at a time. So that's an example if you're just looking for a, for efficiency, how do you need to how do you need to be a well-rounded person to do that? That is one example of the other argument and I know it doesn't sound exciting. It's funny because I I take your example as actually a, a, another exa a, another example for being well-rounded though. How do, how you, do you, you mean? You proved that, you, you know, Photoshop can just completely kill your, your focus. You know, you get really good at this one thing and then all of a sudden, nobody wants it. Yeah. So, now you're not good at anything anymore. Yeah. Now, there's another garbage truck coming through Perfect. here. And I want to, I want to add to this. Oh, look at that. I, gosh, I wish I could show you that beautiful CRNR, Environmental Services garbage truck, but it's it's <laughs> passing us up and it's soon going to be gone. Oh, uh, when Photoshop came in, one of my clients told me, I wish you were doing these digitally. And so I switched over to digital in 1994. Yeah. And... I started doing shadows right away in Photoshop. <laughs> shadows. I also... You're the shadow guy. It, it didn't last long because everybody else found out they could do them too if they just learned Photoshop, which wasn't that hard. And uh, But I'd also done a lot of retouching that was demanding retouching for knowing how light falls on form. Inventing things where you've got to erase something out, but you didn't have a clone tool. You had to actually paint in the thing that was going to replace what you were painting out. And so I knew light on form and when Photoshop came in, I made another ton of money with Photoshop retouching uh, things that couldn't be retouched unless you knew how light was falling on form. So yeah, it was a segue from doing one thing that I lost to doing another because it was not just shadows. <laughs> it was rendering, really. This example is so funny. It's just, it's just you drawing shadows. All I, I'm like, it's hard for me to imagine what these shadows even represented. Like what shadows of what? I may have examples of them. I did. Uh, well, you place a product, a computer, and it's being placed there with other computers around it, and you need to simplify and clean up those shadows, which looked awful in the photograph. Oh my god. But I also invented a lot of computers. There were a lot of computers that I actually painted and they looked just like photographs of computers, but they were done with airbrush. Interesting. And because uh, they didn't, the computer didn't exist for whatever reason. There was, that was, for a, that was a, a reason. large market. <laughs> they, yeah, but sometimes they didn't exist. They were going to exist in about a month, but right now we don't have any. So we have to hire an illustrator to paint them. Oh, oh, I see what you, okay. I thought you meant in general. How is this helping our caller? Well, he's, he's just asking what we prefer. We gave him our preferences. Okay, I think we're done. When it comes to shopping, you want the best bang for your buck, and finding a good deal can mean money left in your pocket to buy other things you really want, like art supplies. One area where you can save some cash without losing quality is by shopping for your razor blades at Harry's. Harry's razors were designed to be affordable while still providing you with a quality shave, but it doesn't stop there. You can get blades, hair care, and shower products all on harrys.com, and just like their blades, Harry's is committed to providing products without breaking the bank. Let Harry's help save money on your grooming habits so you can fuel your creative ones. Listeners to this podcast can get a free Harry's trial set when they go to harrys.com slash draftsman. With it, you get the weighted ergonomic handle for a firm grip, five-blade razor with a lubricating strip and trimmer blade, rich lathering shave gel with aloe to keep your skin hydrated, and a travel blade cover to keep your razor dry and easy to grab on the go. Go to harrys.com slash draftsman to start shaving better today. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp. Do you feel depressed, stressed, or anxious? Well, BetterHelp and their network of over 3,000 US licensed therapists might be able to help you. BetterHelp is changing the way people think about therapy. Before they came along, you would have to book an appointment, drive to an office, and lay out on one of those weird chairs. 
but now you don't have to worry about that because BetterHelp takes everything online. Sessions are conducted by secure video or over the phone. And if talking is not your thing, you can even chat or text with a therapist you choose. I personally enjoy knowing that I can schedule and have a therapy session while I'm on one of my morning walks. Having that familiar environment helps me relax, and walking helps me think clearly. Right now, BetterHelp is offering all Draftsman listeners 10% off your first month with discount code DRAFTSMAN. To get started, go to betterhelp.com slash draftsman. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp.com slash draftsman. Let's go to the next one. Let's go to another. Let's go to another. Hey, Stan. Hey, Marshall. I'm calling from Rochester, New York. I wanted to ask if you think it's inevitable or essential to violate technical rules or visual rules in composition in order for an artist to achieve a style that truly suits them and gives them a visual identity. The most obvious example is Van Gogh, who would deliberately violate the rules of perspective to give his art the centricity it's loved for. Even someone like Paul Rubens, who used sophisticated knowledge of anatomy to render the forms anatomically incorrect, but by doing so achieved a remarkable style. Rockwell, I know, is an artist you both have mentioned, and I think you would be the flip side of that coin as someone who stayed true to form and loyal to most visual and physical rules. So while I think there's an abundance of rule breakers and rule admirers, uh, I wanted to know if either of you had a preference. Um, thanks for taking the time, and I look forward to watching the next podcast. Yeah, I mean, that's one option. Right. Breaking the rules was one option of your style and your persona as an artist. Uh, But you don't have to, you know, Edgar Payne. He has a book on composition and and a lot of most of his work is just like. It's like perfect compositional rules that he followed to to get his images looking the way they do. A lot of the American illustrators you you could study compositional rules based on their s- illustrations but you don't have to <laughs> it's a choice composition is very much emotional and it's about storytelling and and you're the storyteller and you can tell your story in a different way from other people so you should just listen to what you want to do if one of these rules just doesn't speak to you then don't follow it if you like the way it looks when you break one of the rules then do that. Yeah, one example of that in American painting is Edward Hopper. Edward Hopper did these remarkable, emotionally evocative paintings. And somebody put together a book of his locations, the stuff that he painted, and showed that he didn't he didn't stay true to what was actually there at all. He rearranged it so that it felt the way he wanted to feel. Mm-hmm. But that is not the case if you're a medical illustrator. There are some jobs, technical illustrator, where... Medical illustrators have two priorities. One is accuracy and the other is clarity. Yeah. It's got to be easy to understand. That's clear. And it's got to be the truth. But he's talking about personal personal style, I think, right? Yeah. yeah. Your own voice to stand out. You know, if you're a medical illustrator, you're not trying to stand out, right? Well, some uh, medical illustrators do stand out because they've got such gorgeous style. Oh, that really? That enjoy guy. And, oh, yeah, okay. yeah. And some technical illustrators, Richard Leach was one that had an influence on me, uh, but there were a number of others that were such, they just had beautiful style. Hmm. And, but they were doing, they were, Richard Leach would do cutaways of engines and those had to be right. When I did technical illustrations, they had to be, the, the client whose product we were illustrating would comb over them to make sure everything was accurate. And so it, it, it depends. <laughs> Did that, did that just come out of my mouth? <laughs> yeah, it depends. It depends. We should just change the name of our podcast to It Depends. Every answer is the same. Yeah. It depends. Oh, uh, that's great. What's the next? We only have two more. We'll stop and assess whether we want to take up another topic or instruct people on how to leave us voicemails that we want to answer. Oh, shit. <laughs> 
we are seeking better questions. Okay. Well, l- let's not transition. To, please, Marshall, tell tell them how to ask a good question. A good question is usually not one that gives a yes or no answer, unless that's what you're seeking. Is it okay to violate the rules of perspective and anatomy to make a more interesting composition? The answer is yes, it's okay. (laughs) No, wait, the answer is it depends on whether you're a medical illustrator or technical illustrator. Uh, Those questions you can answer yourself if you give it some thought. Uh, And also, just the question, is it okay or can you? Yeah. Those are questions that the answer is almost always yes. Yeah. Can you do something? Yeah, you can. And then see what happens. Yeah. So, can you give us an example of a good question? When you're putting me on the spot, I need to stop and think. But That's if you fine. gave me five minutes away, five minutes away to really make a list, I think I could. Let me. Just, yeah. Let me. Uh, you're good at asking let questions. Me make a note. Uh, good questions. Good questions uh, would be open questions. They would. Oh, here's here's the first thing I would seize on what would make a good question: to acknowledge that there's always at least two answers. Mm-hmm. Yes and no. That's what it depends, it depends means. And then what are the advantages and disadvantages of doing this thing, following all the rules and not deviating from what is correct in this anatomical illustration? What's the disadvantage and advantage? And also, here's something important. This, what are the advantages and disadvantages questions should be coming from something that you've really struggled with, something that you've tried and you can't answer it on your own, and then you are looking to somebody else. I sense that a lot of our questions have been coming from someone who's struggled. But when it's just asking for permission, you can be pretty sure that it's, unless it's, is it okay to go out there and jump into the middle of the road when the garbage truck is going at full speed? The answer is probably no. So ask me a good question. Hey, I tried asking you some questions about what were the workings of Proco and how do you guys get together and manage such a complex organization? What are your meetings like? What software do you use? What kind of questions do you ask? Do you do your, how do you do your meetings? You told us that you do meetings standing. Was that correct? Yes. What a great answer. And that was to something like, what secrets have you found? that make your organization run better. But that was an open question too. Okay. How do you manage something that complex and keep it efficient, knowing some of the problems that come in if I'm trying to do it? You know, one thing that I I feel like might come out of that is having a question that's too open. Yeah. Right? Not giving enough detail where we don't really know what the person means. Like, what do they, what do they want to get out of this question? It's, it's, we could talk about so many things that we're not really sure where to go because they didn't give us enough. Uh, yeah. They didn't limit us enough in our answer. Uh, did we talk on this podcast about Hi, uh, S.I. Hayakawa's abstraction ladder? I don't think so. There was a California senator, S.I. Hayakawa, uh-huh. who wrote a book called Language and Thought and Action. I read it in my 20s. It had a big influence on me. It was a good book on semantics, the use of language. One of the things he mentioned in there is that some people will go up the philosophical ladder to talk about how essence precedes existence and somebody else say, no, existence precedes essence. And you can have conversations that go on for hours between people of a philosophical bent and nobody knows what they're talking about because it's so philosophical. It may be that there's great value in what they're talking about, but people can't grip it. Yeah. And so the opposite of that, the opposite of abstract thinking is concrete language. Abstract language, great big lofty things. Concrete language is the ballpoint pen question. Uh, But when you ask, I've got five different ballpoint pens that I'm working with, and I'm finding that some of them skip and blop, 
and some of them fade. I left it outside and I found out that a day later it was all gone. And uh, the, the, the name of this ballpoint pen is, and you mentioned specifically, it's the Pilot G2 and so on. Those are concrete. You can put them in front of a camera and you can photograph them. You can feel them in your hand. But when you ask, is ballpoint pen a viable option? That has taken it so far up the abstraction ladder as to how would we ever decide whether it's a viable option. It might not be a viable option for this particular client and a very viable option for another. Now, I don't know that I'm explaining this well, but the way Hasai Hayakawa explains it is that when you ask somebody, what is red? <laughs> and you answer, red is a color. And you say, what is a color? And a person says, a color is a quality. What is a quality? A quality is a perceived or actual essence. Well, those things may be true, but they are <laughs> not helpful because they're going up the <laughs> philosophical ladder. But if you take three objects, one of them is the red light on my microphone. Another is a red apple. Another is the red gauge on my computer and you get different objects so that you know that it's not red as an apple, red is a light, red is a gauge, red is a what what it's a it's a thermometer. That's what red is. No, it's not because they're all different enough, but you say they all have this thing in common. You've taken concrete examples and then we start to understand the three year old starts to understand what red is. Now all of this is to say that when we are trying to solve problems, we want to get at what the tangible problem is here in front of us, then get up over it and see the abstract category and then get back down into it. It is this going up and down on the abstraction letter that helps us to think and understand things better. Now, that is a great oversimplification of S.I. Hayakawa's book, but it might be useful. Yeah that big abstract questions, is art necessary? What is art? Is realism a viable option? Those are so abstract that they just lead us into philosophical talk. And do you prefer the manga G-nib by Nico over the manga G-nib by Zebra? That's a very concrete question. And then I can say, I like this one for this reason and the other one for the other reason, but these ones are more expensive. And then we can do the, the comparison of the pros and cons. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> I trust that was useful. I hope so. My mind was racing all over whether this was the most abstract description or too concrete a description <laughs> when I'm using Let specific us know in names the comments. of ballpoint pins. Rate yeah. Marshall's description. Yeah, you can grade me and you can give me a bad grade if I deserve it. But if I if if you give me a bad grade, I trust your grade. Well, maybe I shouldn't say that. I'll trust some of your Set grades. The good ones. <laughs> and if, it, if it's bad from somebody whom I trust, I'll work on okay. it. But that's one of those ones that I might do better to have prepared the speech. Hey, that's a nice sound. Somebody's somebody. Uh... Yeah, someone is calling me. Should you answer it and, and record it just in case we get an interesting conversation? It's from an unknown number. I don't answer those. Oh, I never answer those. <laughs> you do not open your... If you, if you were to call up and say, is it wise to open your door to a stranger in a suburban neighborhood? What would you say, I would Stan? say you look through the peephole first. <laughs> yeah, it depends. Are they holding a gun? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Do they look like a cop? Is it somebody I know? Could they be wearing a mask that looks like somebody I know? There's all are sorts they smiling? of answers to that. Or are they pissed off? Yeah, if they're smiling, let them in. That means you're in a good mood and it's going to be a party. You're totally safe if that person out there looks like they're in a good yeah, mood. If they're holding a bunch of balloons and cake and they're smiling, hey, open that door. You're covered. A person like that couldn't no. do anything wrong. No. Use your head. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. We, we got two more questions in this episode. Let's get through them. Okay, let's go. Hi there. Um, my name is uh, Diego Pons. Uh, I'm 18, and um, I'm starting to uh, push myself further to study art and make it my job. But, but right now, I find myself in a kind of like a fork on like where I want to study. My main problem is that uh, from the beginning, I had a clear path to where I want to study. I found a college that I liked, 
in a program that I might be into because just art, what I wanted to do, illustration. But then I was talking to some of my family, and then one of the main things like uh, they said was the, was the idea of having a, another career that uh, serves as a main career, and then a backup will be art. So I can follow my passion while still having a main being of support for money and things like that. And my dad uh, said things like architecture and things like that. But uh, my main fear is that um, if, if I study this thing, it would be just a waste of time, money, and and like just suffering overall. So like I just don't, maybe I might not enjoy it. But the same thing might happen with my original skill. I may I may study this and find out that it wasn't as as what I liked, or it wasn't uh, the thing that would give me money to like live off to. In the end, I just wanted to like ask is, do you consider it to be a good idea to study a career that serves a backup? It could be something related to art, like architecture, like I said. Or do you think it's better to focus your all into your art? Or just like. No buts, no ifs, just boom, boom, give your all to this one thing. If it, if it works, you, you work. If it doesn't, you keep at it until it works. So want to know. Thank you. I think we can take this question. Yeah. I, uh, it's a good one. Yeah. I like it. I think that it depends. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> but we've got either yes. option, right? We can look at either option. But I think the decision is yours. I would heavily, heavily, personally, I would heavily lean on what I want to do, on my desires. And I personally take bigger risks than most people. And so, I would go all in on the thing that I want. And maybe I take bigger risks because I know I have a support group that I could fall back on if I fail. And so, I feel yeah. like my risk isn't really that big. Um, so, maybe that's the, the reason I could just go all in is because if I lose everything, I could fall back on just going back and living with my parents if, <laughs> if I have to, yeah. you know. Um, so, uh, what's the name? Diego? I think it I think was it, Diego, but yeah. I wasn't sure. If, you know, if you know you have a family that will still support you even if you go against what they say of being an architect, you know, taking, going for the architecture degree, if, if they will still take you in if you fail at art, take that risk. <laughs> Just go all in and do the thing that you want. Trust your gut. You'll be a lot happier. You're taking a risk with a safety net that way. Yeah, like it depends on your safety net. It depends on how much you like taking risks and how much you believe in yourself to be able to carry through with it. Um, and how much are you willing to, to, to work to make sure that that thing that you're going all in on is going to work? Look back at your history in the things that you've set out to do. Are you usually successful? Do you just keep grinding until you've made it work? Or do you give up a lot? I mean, we don't, I don't know. I don't know you. Um, but I think yeah. you probably can trust your gut on this one. And you can decide if you need a to be safe or if you can go all in. Yes. Okay, cool. <laughs> Is that, that's your answer? I want to take a shot at this, but I, I want to sort my thoughts for a moment. Okay. Taking your risk with a safety net, having a plan B, as one of my mentors said, and a plan C and a plan D is wise. He is a military person. He is a strategist. He knows the history of military strategy, and he regularly emphasizes always have a plan B and a plan C and a plan D because things don't go the way you expect them. That's the wise way. Now let's make the other argument. The other argument is that if you want a story to be a worthwhile story, you don't have somebody who sets out to get something and says, oh, this is going to be hard. I think I'll give up on that goal. One of the things that makes a story interesting is to see how far this character will go to make that ending happen, either by getting it or going down, trying to get it, 
or getting it and finding out that it wasn't exactly what they want. There's all sorts of ways it can end. But the energy that impacts the ending of a story is to see whether this character keeps at it no matter what the cost. That's what makes a character archetype. If your archetype is you are the artist, the creative person, the creative professional, if that is your archetype, then there is something to be said for taking the risk at almost any cost to shoot a hole in the bottom of the boat, not to have a boat ready in case this island doesn't work out, but to say there is no option of going back. That means I must make this work. Even if that's in smaller and pretend ways, those those shadows that I learned to master in a matter of a few days, which was rough, but I had no choice. If I had to disappointed that client, word would have gotten out. It's a small world in the advertising agencies of Orange County at the time. Word would have gotten out that I didn't meet the deadline. And so I had to get them done. There is something about that kind of energy. It must be done. I will not take my plan B that can make you rise to higher levels of achievement. So there's, there's, there's the other side of it. Okay, let's move on. Hello, Stan. Hello, Marshall. My name is Mati. I'm 19 years old and I'm from Germany. And here's my question. My goal is to work as a character designer. Yeah, when I look to uh, when I look at paintings by masters, I always ask myself how do I study best to get to this level in all areas. So anatomy, color skills, shading, and so on. Um, currently in the happy situation that I have a lot of free time, I draw two to four hours a day. Um, my question is, should I first concentrate on drawing and, and anatomy to learn uh, because that alone takes a lot of time already or everything at the same time, say also painting and color theory. Yeah, I do not know how to do it all, especially uh, when I have less time later. Yeah, I hope you can help me, and thank you. Uh, we've we've answered this one before. Yeah, I'm not even sure I understood it. He's though. he was asking if he should uh, s focus on one thing or study multiple things at once. Yeah, and that business of asking should I or should I not, the answer will be it depends. When people ask. Do I study multiple things at the same time? When you say at the same time, what do you mean? Is it within the same day, within the same hour, within the same month, within the same year? What 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 is considered at the same time? You know, because like, you could say that um, you're focused on only color this week. And then you focus on color. And then next week you take up something else that, and, and, and you decide that next week what it is going to be because you might be interested in studying something else at that moment. So you give yeah. yourself freedom to change what your focus is, but not switching focuses too often before you can really make some progress on your current focus. So you, you have to have a balance of what, how you focus on things. The word balance has come up so often in these answers. Yeah. That that is that is where the why that's why the answer is always it depends. <laughs> what was it? Let's go back over the, the last thing you said though. Yeah. Uh, just before you said it's a balance. Balance between what and what? Between switching between you know to the next thing before you made progress on the current thing you're focused on. Uh, here's what I want to say about that. The the answer to questions like, should I focus on one thing at, and learn that and then move on to this? Or should I study things simultaneously? Some of these questions come out of a failure to understand that your education is a creative pursuit. Mm. There is not a single answer that says it's got to be this way. Sometimes. Yeah, but... This is your education. And when you get your education, your training, your interests out in front of you and look at it, seeking connections, 
seeking opportunities, recognizing, I, I think it was with Steven Spielberg, who was wondering who was going to be Indiana Jones. And they were auditioning people. And then he said to one of his colleagues, hey, we've got the guy right here under our noses. It was Harrison Ford. But he, that had not occurred to him. There's no one right casting, but he had not been aware for a long time of the work that he was doing that it was right there under him. That's why getting these things out in front of your face and seeking the connections will allow you to create your own answers. Otherwise, getting feedback from people whom you deem experts can be useful, but ultimately they don't make your decisions for you. Nice. That's it. Many of these questions are questions for mentors. And here's what mm. I mean. Because it depends. You are asking. Because <laughs> they depend. Because they depend. And when you're asking people on a podcast who all they know is the tip of this question, yeah. for them to give you advice is, if, is like asking a doctor, hey, my head hurts. What do I do? The doctor needs to ask you more questions to know whether you should take an aspirin, take a nap, or get <laughs> surgery for that tumor. It's a big difference in answers. That's great. Do you need a nap or surgery? That's awesome. So, yes, it, it's, it's feedback, asking the question of someone, and that can happen if you've got a mentor who even gives you 20 minutes, a half hour, that they can figure out, figure you out figure you out enough to know what it is that they really need to give yeah. you. And it may not be a simple answer, but it may be. If you've been overworked and you need rest, sometimes that's just obvious. Yeah. Maybe now, we should have a segment where we act, we get actual callers come, calling in live so we can ask them follow-up questions. Stan, I do think that. And it may be that we want to start with people that we know well enough but I see this happening every time. We spend a full hour on the one caller. This may be a reason to, instead of opening it up to questions, opening it up to people that we would like to right. ask them questions. Oh. Scott Flanders comes to mind. Yeah. Mm. Oh. Vance Kovacs comes Marshall. to mind. This is the perfect time to record episodes with a third person. It's the perfect time. Because we can't have them come into the studio, right? That was one of the issues is like, where are we going to put them? Well, it's like, well, they record their own feed. Stan, you just had a, you had a creative breakthrough. <laughs> well, you, you, you threw it at my face. We did this together. Yeah, yeah. This is the time to ask questions of people that we've always wished we could. All right, we make our list. You've asked questions of almost everybody that I've wanted to ask questions of. You've, you've done your, your spotlights on artists. But having you in the conversation will definitely make it different. Well, I'm all for this. I mean, I think we should just start with Scott Flanders and then see how it goes. Yeah, I do too. Yeah. And then, uh, and then we'll make our list. Yeah, because we both know him. Yeah, yes. we both know him. We both like him. That's right. We admire him. I think he's a he's a good one to start with. And then we could speculate that if we, even though we don't have a particular person here because they might even be long gone, what they might say. Oh, that's dangerous territory. But uh, enough of them have written. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci did those notebooks. I would love to do a class. It might be it might be a one week thing. It might stretch out to two or three meetings over a year of Leonardo da Vinci's notebooks because they're, they've been translated into English. That's how I read them, or at least I read uh, a abridged version of them. And they were, they were not really dense with advice, but there were a few good nuggets in there. And to pull out drawing or uh, lessons in creativity from da Vinci. Lessons in creativity from Van Gogh. Oh, gosh, that would be great on it on its own. Any of these ones of the past and to compile all of this information and say that we can have a mock interview with them or even just do a presentation on all the lessons you need to know uh, that this teacher can offer. I love doing that kind of thing. Yeah. 
I'm excited about bringing in people that we want to ask them questions. And, and we could open it up to callers, but yeah, let's move in that direction since we're still locked down. Yeah. Are you enjoying the lockdown, Stan? I am. You know, I, I feel like I could have it either way and I'll be fine. I, I don't mind being confined uh, to my space. Yeah. You know, I, I don't even know the wisdom of saying that in public because I know that some people are really going through tough times right now. Have you seen that that meme of artists before the lockdown and artists in yeah, isolation and, it's the same and artists? Yeah, and it's all the <laughs> yeah, same exactly. picture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think people, some people. Um, it, it it also it depends. <laughs> it depends on your situation. Like if you have four kids at home, it's tough to be an artist because yeah. they're all running around and they're jumping on you, and you can't concentrate. But if you have your quiet space at home, then you're fine staying home. You know, with me, I only ha I have one son downstairs that I could hear him and it's just his voice and I'm fine with that. It, to me, that's not noise. But if there were four of them running around like crazy banging yeah. on walls, that I think, I don't yeah. know if I would enjoy that. So... I've, I've felt more connected with a number of people who are not close by and some even that even are close by because we just talk on the phone and we we do Zoom meetings and Skype. And so I haven't felt any lack of connection with people. Just It's just a different set of, of physical circumstances. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for your voicemails. I think yes. all of your questions are wonderful. Marshall might disagree, but I don't think there's such thing as a bad question. <laughs> I'm just kidding. There absolutely is a bad question. Um, Stan is lying. I am lying. <laughs> yes, and thank you for tuning in with us. Very nice. All right. Bye, Marshall. See you, Stan.